Hey y'all, welcome back to another episode of Explained by Michael. Today we're going to look at the definition of the words and what they mean together, the three defining characteristics of a CDF, the relationship via integration to the PDF, and we're going to draw one out finally at the end. Prior knowledge for today's video, it would be very good to watch my other video on probability functions so we have a basic understanding of what that is. And then we're going to need to know a little bit about integration. No mathematics for today, just understanding that integration is the accumulation of area over time. So let's look at the definition of a cumulative distribution function. So there's really nothing hidden in this definition, right? Cumulative just means to accumulate, so we're gathering over time. Distribution tells us how it's spread out. Is it bunched towards one end, or toward the other, or evenly distributed? And then the function says that for any given input, it will give us an output. So we can measure something for a given x. And in this case, we're measuring probability. This might be a new concept for some of us. The CDS tells us the accumulated probability, so we're adding up all the probabilities until given x. So let's compare the difference between what the PDF tells us and what the CDF tells us. And again, all of this is based on the word accumulated. We're building up the probabilities of occurrence. And the last part of our definition is going to look at three conditions which make a function a CDF. CDFs can exist outside of probability in and of itself. It's not as useful, but any function that matches these three conditions is technically a CDF. This is something we talk a lot about in calculus. A non-decreasing function means the height never goes down. The height can, and actually will, stay the same or increase, but it can never go down. And we'll look at that again at the very end when we have a picture of our CDF. These next two rules can be thought of how we usually think of sine and cosine. Sine and cosine will never exceed the bounds 1 or negative 1. Similarly, a CDF can never dip below the y-axis and never increase greater than 1. It's always bound between these two. And this is a rule that we used to in probability. We know that we can never have a negative probability of an event occurring, and we know that the probability can never exceed 100%. It makes sense that our bounds then are 0 and 1 for this. Now, I said that any function that meets these three rules is technically a CDF. And in my experience in taking tests and studying this academically, really there's two types that we'll be dealing with. One is actual distribution. So the normal and the exponential and the Weibull distribution, they have CDFs, of course, and we can use that to find probabilities of something occurring. The second, and which we'll talk about in the next video after this, is seemingly random functions that are used to test your ability and your knowledge on this. So they might give you a, uh, a PDF and ask you to find the CDF or ask you to find the probability um, between 0.5 and 0.7 or something along those lines. And this doesn't have re any real world meaning, but it's used to test your knowledge of integration, your knowledge of CDF, your knowledge of maybe finding the mean and the standard deviation of this CDF. Now the final aspect that we need to go over before we can dive into this is the fundamental theorem of calculus and the application relating the PDF and the CDF.
This is the most important thing in today's video, really. Understanding that the accumulated area, and that's what an integral does, an integral adds up the areas. The accumulated area of the PDF defines our CDF. That's what it is, that's really all that it is. And oftentimes in our textbooks or in lectures, we'll see it written as such, where the little f of x denotes the PDF and the big f of x denotes the CDF. So again, most important takeaway is not the essential limit theorem or the fundamental theorem of calculus. Most important takeaway is understanding that the CDF adds up the area of the PDF. Adding up the area allows us to do something that we cannot do on just the PDF. Let's look at this example. The input is our temperature, and the output, of course, is always the probability of current. Say this is an example in Arizona, where we're very unlikely to have low temperatures, and we're very likely to have high temperatures. We're also very unlikely, though, to have temperatures in the 200s or 150 degrees. So it might take the shape of this. Our most likely value is 100. And over here where sometimes we get 50 degrees, sometimes we get 150 degrees, let's say, um, but our most likely probability is 100. Now, if I asked you to find the probability that the temperature for a given day would be between 90 and 100 degrees, if we were not using the CDF method, we would have to find the probability of each one of these values occurring. And you might be thinking, oh, it's a probability of 90, 91, 92, 93, et cetera, occurring. But really, there's an infinite number of values in between 90 and 100. We could have 90.78563 degrees. We could have 99.99999 degrees. There's an infinite number of values, so we can't just add up the values in between these. We need to use the CDF method, which tells us the integral, which will tell us the area. 